was uh, stupid, not young anymore, but stupid. A guy came to me and said, you know, there's something called cinnamon challenge that you just have to take a, a, a teaspoon of cinnamon and try to, uh, to keep it in your mouth for, for 10 seconds. And uh, of course I tried it and I puked my guts out. Sorry. And this is actually the best cinnamon challenge that I saw. So she didn't have a teaspoon. I was like that, I swear. <laughs> okay. There's some sort of a chemical reaction that dries everything out. Uh, <laughs> I was like that <laughs> from a teaspoon, okay? <laughs> That's the best one <laughs> I saw so far. And she keeps on cursing for a few minutes and it's not passing by. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> That, that's authentic reaction, I'm not kidding. You should really try that at home, okay? <laughs> a teaspoon of cinnamon, or, or friends, of course, really like trying to show they're brave. Okay? And, and, and it keeps on going, and it burns for 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you write the cinnamon challenge, that's the first video, and it's hilarious because she talks, I don't know, it's good for your cinnamon, why people complain? And she gets it now. Okay, that's something that I had to share. I just talked with a friend who made me do the cinnamon challenge. Not fun. Okay, so nice meeting each and every one of you. And uh, uh, I'm David. So I've been in this industry, I think, for uh, the past 23 years now. And I started uh, as a developer for the first decade or so. And I, uh, I'm from Israel, originally. And uh, this is back in the day when I used to play with Photoshop. And uh, I've been through uh, several different uh, high-end companies, of them, and I've co-founded several different startup companies. Uh, most of them information security based, but not all of them. And I think that we can all agree that the number one challenge today is data theft. And, and uh, there's a lot of buzzwords, and each presenter starts with a few slides that talks about how, uh, how uh, scary it is out there, and how serious it is out there, and how people are hacking everything. But I, I want to just uh, uh, put a few points on target because in 2011 something really interesting happened the FBI actually have named organized data theft as a bigger criminal industry than drugs trading and the biggest issue today in the United States actually is uh, identity theft it starts from very small things like stealing your identity and, and printing my, a licensed driver with your information and my picture and when a police officer stops me because I'm uh, driving too fast I will give him this driving license and it really quickly gets to uh, getting a mortgage on your behalf using my uh, of course bank account and it can get to much worse and if in the past getting uh, a successful identity theft I had to find a target, you know, a victim, go to his place and probably steal a few different mail that he gets in his mailbox in order to duplicate his, his identity. And it took some time, but today, with today availability and available information, all it takes a successful and let me, uh, excuse me for saying stupid SQL injection attack, and I can get probably 10,000 identities I can duplicate to a successful identity theft. And the, the thing is that those are, by the way, just a few highlights of the passing year and a half and some of the biggest names that you know out there some of the biggest companies each and every company got a massive uh, information security teams are spending a lot of money on information security but still they have been breached those are by the way a few highlights databreaches.org try to uh, put everything in, in, in a right list and everything is being named but isn't it a question of if it's not a question of if but it's more a question of when you're next Next. And I'm not trying to scare anyone here, but I'm talking about facts. And the facts says, and, and the, the, I, I think the horrible thing is that it almost doesn't matter how much money you'll spend, and of course it's important to spend as much money as possible, yeah, we're all vendors in this <laughs> market, but with that, how can you truly understand what's going on? And the, the question is the motivation for database security, and it's even more accurate to say for data security, because there's a threat economy. And this is something that people try to uh, look around that, but someone is sponsoring teams and sponsoring research teams in order to make your information available for him.
Your information can be just your HR information, it can be your customer list, it can be your uh, actually uh, financial information, but someone is sponsoring this industry. And when this industry is being sponsored, of course, this industry grows. How Madonna said, we live in a material world and I'm in a material girl. And specifically when it comes to a threat economy, this is something we have to understand that someone uh, 24-7 is doing their best in order to get money for information is about to steal from our organizations. And it starts from the simplest things like uh, uh, worms that have no direct uh, uh, destination and direct type of organization that are just spreaded, are looking for vulnerable uh, browsers, and once it's uh, uh, injected, it's just zipping and encrypting the documents, the default documents and documents drive, and just uploading it to Dropbox, randomly. Okay, they don't care exactly how they get you. And the more efficient one are directed uh, attacks like the, uh, you all heard about the target, which was extremely advanced one. The attack was on the point of sales uh, uh, that actually been used in stores and uh, it's getting more and more sophisticated. But what I'm trying to say here that your information that most likely is stored inside of databases is the destination of huge industries. The target information that was actually stolen is on sale now on the black market and those links by the way are available for everyone. So you can go online and offer the amount of money you're willing to pay in order to get information online of actually of known breaches. And when it comes a lot, uh, many times when people are talking about databases, and this is an important fact, and I'm trying just to, to summarize the, the, the attack surface, many times people don't really understand who is under attack. And people are saying, no, but, but listen, our databases are actually not uh, uh, connected to the internet. No one has direct access to the databases. Yes, you're right. But those databases are many times are available, this inf the information inside of these databases are available through web applications. And many times people don't really understand who is under attack. Because when we're talking about a web application attack surface, many times the company that holds the website are not even the destination of the attack are not the direct of the attack. Many times when I'm attacking a web, not I, he, but many times when he attacks a web application, uh, he's not attacking the, the data store of the specific website. He's actually attacking different users that also use this web front. So this is something that we have to understand that everything in security is multi-layered. On this specific talk, I'm gonna talk about database security, but of course there's endless different types of, of vectors and, and layers that have to be secured when we're talking about security. So, I'm specifically Green SQL focuses on database security. Without a doubt, any application that you might use that contains dynamic information, meaning you're able to update information, delete information, and change it, the information is stored inside of database. And any database that you might have inside of your organization have two types of connection. And we can talk about endless amount, but eventually it uh, sums up to two types. Automated connection means any application you have inside of your organization that have a connection string and is able to retrieve, update, change information, and sometimes actually also do some sort of configuration at the database that is able to get to the information through a connection string that we've configured. The second type of connection is the user-based connection. And many times people say, no, no, those are user I trust. I want to uh, just tell you a very short story about one of the biggest companies actually at the, the West Coast that this company have, just to give you a number, 70 DBAs on site, besides a consulting firm that they also use. And uh, this company was under attack, but serious, and, and at first they were sure that the information is being stolen through their websites, uh, through sophisticated attacks in their network, no. Today, you won't believe how LinkedIn becomes a tool of the trade about getting the destination to a successful attack. In LinkedIn, uh, those, uh, those uh, tech firms actually searched for all DBAs working in this company. 
Why? If I have to take advantage of, uh, more, uh, sorry, if I have to attack a company that have a layered security. So it starts, of course, with the DDoS prevention or detection that they get as a service, and get it, then it goes forward to firewalls, and then to IPS, and then application security, and then probably some sort of an endpoint signature-based or anomaly-based security that is located inside of the organization. This company looked for each and every DBA that works in the company. They send all of them mails, and of course they added them to their groups, and they added them to their connections, and uh, once they added them to their connection, they just started sending them mails. One of the mails, of course, included them a, a malware, and this malware took over the DBA computer. So if I'm taking over the DBA computer, I don't care anymore about any network security layers that I have. I'm already inside the computer that have the credentials and have the direct access to the database, and I'm able to take whatever I need. Any auditing mechanisms that is installed and running as part of the database won't alert me anything. It is the DBA using the database. Many times he's been whitelisted. So we have to take into consideration when we're talking about database security, those two types of connection. And many times it's becoming more and more sophisticated when we're talking about it. About how you talk with a database. So many of us are just focusing about the language of SQL. But actually, when we got a connection to the database, we're talking about complete three different layers that have to be investigated and have to be actually analyzed in order to understand the security level. A database, first of all, there's the connection level. And each and every database and each and every protocol that it's got its own connection level. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about an SSL-based connection or not. Second of all, we have the application protocol, meaning in Microsoft SQL, it's TDS. In Oracle, it's TNS. In MySQL, it's MySQL Net. But when we're talking about the communication, it's also the different vari uh, variation of the protocol itself. For example, even if I'll install the latest Microsoft SQL 2008 in my network, or 2012, or even 2014, and I have an old legacy application that is uh, working with an ODBC driver, which is 12 years old my database will be still able to communicate with this application because of compatibility support. And several of the vulnerabilities are actually part of the old versions of the TDS protocols. And again, this is prior to authentication. This is prior to negotiation with the database. Only after that, we get to the SQL syntax itself. So now we have to understand each and every command, what exactly it means and what exactly it's supposed to execute inside of the database. <coughs> And this brings me, I think, to the most important part about any security mechanism, any system that you'll ever have to deal with, understanding the attackability surface. And this is the main thing about security. When we're trying to understand which are our softest link of a system. And when we're talking about Microsoft SQL, for example, this is just a nice example, Microsoft SQL is an application, a very sophisticated application, by the way. Uh, for example, Microsoft SQL manages its own uh, I.O. resource, manages its own memory writing, manages its own CPU hazards. Actually, uh, there's no really a reason to have it running on an operating system, unless it's about making more money from licensing, but that's how it works. It's an application running on an operating system. Any of the following attack vectors that you can see in front of you will lead to a successful breach of Microsoft SQL without you even knowing that, even though you've enabled uh, auditing and logging and whatsoever. And what I'm trying to say that in order to see the wider picture of information security of any system you might be running in your architecture, you have to take a look about the attackability surface. So we have a Microsoft SQL, great. We have installed the latest patches, great. But we have a, a, a very simple vulnerability of misconfiguration running on our operating system that can lead anyone to copy two files from the operating system. And that all it takes in order for someone to copy our entire database without any auditing system even alerting us that it happened. And that's what's happening many times. We make sure we run the latest patches of our software, but we have some sort of a third-party application running there for five years that no one even knows about. So asset management is part of that. Understanding the topology is part of that. Understanding the architecture is also a very important part of what I'm talking about. So I started with databases, but something really interesting has been happening, and this is, I think, the the flow of the market which is happening on an endless basis. Uh, 
At first, everything was concentrated. If you remember, even at the days of the closed system like VMS, everything was consolidated. Everything was running in one place. And so the major databases, which started about 30 years ago, have went on with the same approach. We have centralized databases. We have huge databases located in our data centers, and they store the core databases. But as time passes, any application uh, have actually started using dynamic content. And this content have required the database. So since 2000, since early 2000 actually, we see organization that started with a few thousands of databases have quickly wrapped up to 100,000 databases without changing the number of customers they have or the type of offering they offer through their architecture. So almost any application requires to have a backend database. Any application have some sort of a, a, a backend database that can provide it. Sometimes it's just configuration level information, sometimes it's actually uh, sensitive information what's called PII. And the past three years, actually, there's a huge movement to a cloud-based database services. Microsoft SQL Azure was announced actually four years ago, uh, which was, at first, to be honest, was quite of a joke, but last year they sold over a billion dollar of a database as a service. And this year, they're, they're probably gonna get to somewhere next to two billion dollar using database as a service. What I'm trying to say here, that there's a huge movement from uh, uh, I, I think consolidated huge databases to openly uh, spread the databases, and now it's moving a lot to database as a service, but one more thing, it's sort of also starting to move back to consolidated database. System like Pivotal and other uh, uh, big data architectures and big data systems have started taking everything back to a consolidated system. So this is interesting how the, uh, the, the information works, but when it comes to database as a service, like anything Thing in the cloud, this is a real revolution. Because uh, not only that, of course, it's easy to use, it's easy to configure, easy to, uh, to, to work with as a, as a database platform, but it reduces costs, and this is the main thing. If I'll ever need or I'll ever want to use a database in the cloud and just set up a database to one application that I'm running as part of a, of a service that I'm providing to my customers, I can have the database up and running and uh, fully backupped, fully uh, maintained, fully high availability within a minute. Unless I would like to install everything by myself and configure everything by myself. So. There's a lot of questions that are being uh, popped up when we're talking about the challenges of securing a database. And more important, again, is the challenges of securing the data. The sensitive information, and this is, I think, the main thing. What is exactly stored inside of the database? If, you ha if your company has to comply with regulations, and there are plenty of different regulations, the question is what is considered as sensitive and where exactly it's stored inside of the database. Uh, we have several thousands of customers using Green SQL, and it's unbelievable to see that, I think, not even one company had a clear idea and a clear list of which sensitive information is actually stored where inside of the organization. And, and many times they don't even know where or all their databases are installed. And more than that, the DBA have no clue where the application developer or the application that they just purchased is storing the sensitive information at. And going back, I think we can sum up all those questions that are popping up to, to probably three specific questions. Where is the sensitive data and how can I make sure who can touch it and who can change it and who can do whatever he wants with it? The second thing is, as I mentioned at the beginning, a user-based connection. How can I truly take control about who can do what inside of my database? And the third one, vulnerabilities that are not part of my database. SQL injection is a good example, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So a lot of companies see regulation as a hassle, as a big issue, as a problem. But uh, I think the past few years, people started understanding that they can gain benefits. They can get budgets. Companies that have to comply with regulation, it's easier to get money for, it's for implementing a security project. It's easier when a specific requirement of HIPAA, for example, requires you to monitor any access to sensitive data to get budgets in order to implement security products or just even just to upgrade the current architecture. So it's a question about what you get from the multiple regulation and the compliances. And each compliance, by the way, have its own requirements. 
Uh, you know, regulations and compliances have an extremely wide range of requirements, from which uh, uh, TV cameras I'm having at the entrance to my office, up to an antivirus running on the host base, but each one of them also have several requirements when it comes to the database itself. So in order to comply with that, you just have to make sure that you have the information. So sensitive data discovery have become a, an important part of probably any organization that have to understand and have to map where exactly sensitive information is stored inside of his organization. Because you can have the greatest tools, but if you cannot make sure that you can configure the appropriate policy. Separation of duty, this is a, a major requirement that started from regulation and now becomes sort of a, a, a commonly requirements when it comes to security. Separation of duties is also being referred as segregation of duties, eventually means that the DBA should have the option to administrate the database, but he should never have the option to view sensitive data. And on the other hand, my application guys should have the option to view sensitive data, but they should never have the option to run administrative commands. And how can I well, basically easily can enforce separation or segregation of duties in a company-wide database implementation. So this is an important question and in a few minutes we'll get to the cloud challenges and what exactly it requires. So a lot of being talked, this is a 15-year-old breach SQL injection. Uh, I guess everyone heard this buzzword. Just to summarize it up, I'm not going to go... Uh, I actually wanted to show a very interesting example, but it's not my computer. They don't have HDMI here. I apologize for that. You will pay, David. But the thing about SQL injection is that uh, it doesn't matter how secure is your database because this is not a real database vulnerability. This is a third-party application that have a connection to the database. If in the past SQL injections were only disclosed in a web application, today you can find also closed application, client-based, client-server-based application that are vulnerable to SQL injection attack. A person that wrote those applications have never took into consideration the option that will, people will try to manipulate the command and the inputs they put in those applications in order to get information from the database. Uh, which application are vulnerable to SQL injection? More or less, almost any kind that wasn't written in the appropriate way. So you can have a full list. SQL injection is actually one of the most talked uh, subject when it comes to security. OWASP have named it again the number one breach when it comes to web application security. SQL injection have evolved in the meaning that if in the past it was just about getting information from your organization, it become a tool that provides you an option to interact with the operating system and to start expanding your influence inside of the organization. So if I use just to steal the information from the database, today I actually use SQL injection as a transport layer. And just to give you a, a more important uh, example and a more sophisticated example of how people use SQL injection. So in, in one of my lectures that I'm talking about the blind, uh, the blind spot of information security and what people can actually cannot mitigate with any solution today, I'm talking about vulnerabilities in, in uh, hardware solutions. And this specifically is not a vulnerability, but this is actually a very interesting backdoor. Because today, when you have a, in, actually installing a hard drive as part of your server or as part of your operating system, how many of you have ever rewritten the, uh, 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 the software that runs on the hard drive itself? Not the operating system, not a file system itself. But today, you can actually buy it or build it by yourself if you're interested. You can have a device that helps you rewrite <coughs> the SATA code that runs on the hard drive itself. And you can add code to those hard drives. Meaning, if I would like to get into your organization, I, I can of course start mapping and sending malware and, and mapping your security level. But on the other hand, if I can take over a hard drive that you're about to install in your uh, premises, you will never know that there's some code waiting there to be executed. Of course, it's a very limited code. But can I actually add a malicious code to a hard drive? You will of course format it. Yes, don't worry about it. It's not running at the layer that you can format. It's not the, where the file system is going to be staying. But what I'm trying to, to, to show you here, those types of vectors can actually be executed through SQL injection attacks. So if I was able actually to add some sort of a payload running inside of your hard drive, what exactly or how exactly can you even know that I've initiated this attack? 
and I can just uh, initiate this type of a payload through a SQL injection. If you have a vulnerable SQL injection, I'm able to send a command through the application to the operating system, write a specific block of the LBA, and then start and initiate the attack of the hard drive. It's actually stored already in the hard drive. Many times company says, yeah, but I will never allow any incoming binary code, any execution code into the organization. That's correct. What if it's already there? So this is a, 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 a qu an interesting question because how much control we truly have and how much information we truly understand regarding what's happening inside of our organization. What I try to show you here, how SQL injection that at the past was about just stealing information is being actually used as a communication layer. And many times we don't take it into consideration because people may say, I don't have any sensitive information on this server, I don't care. Great, but if I'm able to take over the database server and then started starting accessing another servers on those networks, and then I'm able to get maybe access to several of the workstation, and all of that because of vulnerable, uh, even I can say stupid web application that you didn't care about because you thought you have no sensitive information on this specific server. So. When we're talking about just to trying to summarize the scope of database security, when we're talking about the multi-layer, first we have to understand the elements that are talking with our database. Then we have to map and understand the application, and more important, the driver versions that are using through our database. Hardening the database application is always important. Hardening the operating system is always important. And when it comes to the database application itself, yes, make sure you're running the latest version with the latest patch, and that's a known, uh, sentence that have been used for the past 20 years. Uh, when it comes to a cloud-based database, many of those, uh, I think, challenges are actually not in our control. Because as a cloud service, we do not have the option to take control of the operating system. We do not have the option to install whichever version we're interested or to patch it on our own accorded agenda. So uh, when we're using as a cloud, the only thing that we can control is the sensitive information itself in order to know where exactly it's located and who can exactly do whatever he wishes with those type of information. Uh, under the data, I wrote information and stored procedure itself. Uh, in Microsoft SQL, 80% of the usage with a database is based on stored procedures and not on native SQL commands. And stored procedure can be very simple, but there can be extremely sophisticated. A use of stored procedure, it's much more uh, recommended, of course. It's a better security, a better performance, uh, better reliability when it's running on the database itself and not based on multiple commands that are just about to get to the database. So stored procedure got its own uh, a full, I guess, information security challenge. Uh, we are about to out of time, so I would like to thank you first, and if you have any questions...